In the late 1800s and early 1900s, eastern Clark County was often visited by the Cooper family, a traveling band of gypsies who traded horses, told fortunes, and made many friends here. The death of a young daughter and her burial in Marshall Cemetery solidified the family's relationship with the area and they continued to visit for many more years. The family left many traces of their visits here, not only in the tombstones in the cemetery, but also tales of a queen's blessing on the town of Marshall. Join us to learn all about the family's origins, those laid to rest here, the blessing on the town, and more, told in the words of those who personally knew the family and remembered their visits. If you live near Marshall, you may have visited the Cooper family stone in Marshall Cemetery. Let's explore the history of the Cooper family, their gypsy roots, and the legends they left behind here in Clark County. Let's start with a few definitions or terms. I've tried in my reporting to be respectful of the families and their heritage and use appropriate terms. Well, gypsy is not a term used by the families themselves. It comes from Egypt or Egyptian, as that's where Europeans believe the families came from. It's not necessarily derogatory, but should always be capitalized when written to show that we're talking about an ethnic group. Rom is the name used by the families to describe themselves by the majority of English gypsies in their own language. May have roots in an old Indian word, dom, which means man. Roma is the plural form of Rom. Romani is an ethnic term for the English group of gypsies and can be spelled with a Y or an I. Romani with a Y usually refers specifically to the native Romani subgroup in England. These terms further confuse origins of the families as it seems to imply ties to Romania. So who are these people we call gypsies? They're often celebrated in songs, paintings, stories, and poems, and seem to represent a bit of nostalgia and romance, of a colorful, carefree nomadic life, simpler, closer to nature, a charming lifestyle to be envied. In reality, their history has been one of hardship. As I mentioned, the term gypsy originated from Western Europeans who believed the families originally came from Egypt. The Romani language has proven to be the key to tracing the roots of those families back to India in the 10th century, as the language is based on the Indian language. The root of their travels can be traced as they borrowed words from the various peoples they met as they journeyed west, incorporating Persian, Kurdish, and Armenian languages. They migrated from northern India through the Middle East and into Europe by the 1300s. Ancestors of the gypsies of Europe left India for a variety of reasons, some to serve the rich courts of Persian and Arab dynasties in the Middle East, while others were brought as captives, slaves. A third, smaller nomadic group found that their way back to India was cut off by con conflict and instead moved westward. Romani families have faced hardship and prejudice for centuries. They left India by 1192 when the Battle of Terrain was fought. They headed to the Middle East, but were on the move again in 1347 when the Black Death reached Constantinople. By the 1400s, gypsies were reported in many European countries, from Italy to Switzerland, including Germany, Spain, France, and Holland. In 1514, they're first mentioned in English records. Just a few years later, in 1530, the expulsion of all Jews was ordered from England. In 1554, a death penalty was introduced for all who did not leave the country within one month. The 1500s through 1700s continued this trend with various laws passed and expulsion of gypsies all across Europe. If allowed to remain in a country, they were not allowed to travel or camp or even wear their ethnic clothing. They were forbidden to marry other gypsies and had to become land workers or be apprenticed to learn a traditional European craft. In some countries, they were required to register a permanent address in a permanent city. By the 1800s, things were starting to improve with immigration restrictions easing across Europe and the emancipation of gypsy slaves. The 1850s saw the immigration to the United States from England for many gypsy families, including the Coopers. Earlier migrations had brought various gypsy families to South America and Canada. There were even reported to be some that traveled with Columbus. So why did the families face these obstacles, these prejudices? 
When gypsies first migrated to Europe, they were farm workers, blacksmiths, and mercenary soldiers, as well as musicians, fortune tellers, and entertainers. This made them an interesting diversion to the bleak everyday life of that time period. But they soon drew the attention of three powerful forces, the state, the church, and the guild. The state, the government, wanted everyone to settle legally at a permanent address to be accountable for taxes. The church was worried about the spiritual corruption that came with such a lively way of living and were especially concerned about the heresy of fortune telling. The guilds did not like to see their prices undercut by newcomers who worked all hours of the day and night with wives and children helping, trading from tents or carts. Additionally, these immigrants were dark skinned, a negative feature in Europe, and often suspected of being spies for the Turks since they had arrived from the east. Many Romani families began immigrating from England in the 1850s. Led in 1854 by Levi Stanley and 26 members of the Stanley, Harrison, and Cooper families who ranged in age from infant to elderly. Life was changing drastically in England in the 1850s. Factories could now produce goods much cheaper and faster than the families could by hand, public lands were being converted to agricultural lands and pastures to feed the growing population, and roadside camping was prohibited. The group arrived on July 1st in New York City on a ship named Tri that had departed from Glasgow, Scotland. Although many of the families were wealthy enough to travel in better circumstances, all of the Romani families on this voyage traveled in steerage below the ship's deck with the lower classes of passengers. Cramped quarters, lack of fresh air, and highly unsanitary conditions made for an utterly miserable voyage. Family tradition, passed down orally from these early immigrants, tells that the travelers wanted to be as inconspicuous as possible while carrying with them great wealth of jewelry and gold coin. Stories are told of these items being baked into loaves of bread to be taken aboard the ship with other provisions unknown to custom officials and other passengers. Levi's father and mother, Owen and Harriet Stanley, arrived in 1856 with additional members of the Stanley and Jeffrey families. These families were closely related to the Coopers and have fascinating histories of their own. Let's take a brief look at them before diving into the Cooper family. The Stanley family, which Stanley Avenue in Dayton, Ohio is named after, owned 6,000 acres around the Dayton region and a stately mansion there for several years. They're often reported to be the largest and one of the wealthiest Romani families in England. Harriet survived only a little more than a year after her arrival in America, while Owen lived just a few years longer and passed in 1860 in his wagon outside Hanover, Indiana, leaving behind 12 children, 40 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. Shortly after setting foot on U.S. soil, Owen and Harriet found themselves in Ohio's Miami Valley. Owen, then king of his family, proclaimed the area as his home. He would invest in land there, build a home and a farm for his family to return to each winter where they could gather in comfort, graze their livestock, and plan their summer wanderings. Interestingly, after King Owen's death, the property was sold at public sale at the county courthouse in the early 1860s. This is one of my favorite Romani stories to envision. The highest bidder, who arrived at the sale in a silk dress, red cape, and jewelry, was Mrs. Stanley Jeffries, Owen's daughter. This was at a time when women didn't really own property or have many legal rights. This brings to mind a very Scarlett O'Hara, gone with the wind moment. Thus, the estate remained in the family for many more years. The Stanleys have an impressive plot at Woodland Cemetery in Dayton and are reported to be the first family to establish a common burial ground and the first to have poetry engraved on their stones. The first burial was Harriet in 1857 and we've documented burials as recent as 1999 for a direct relative and 2018 for a great great granddaughter-in-law. Five generations, including in-laws and Owen and Harriet's great-great-grandchildren are buried here. Elizabeth Stanley Harrison was sister to Levi, daughter of Owen and Harriet, and married Isaac Harrison. Isaac was the son of Benjamin Harrison and Maria Burton. 
The Harrisons were another prominent family that often married with the Coopers. The two families traveled together for a time. A newspaper reported in the late 1800s that the families were no longer traveling together, but did not specify why. Falling outs were not uncommon amongst groups, and not always for huge reasons. The Harrisons established a base in Evansville, Indiana, spending winters in the South, but returning to Evansville each spring. Newspapers report they always had their wagons repaired and repainted in Evansville before heading out on their annual travels. It's interesting to note that Evansville, like the Stanley's home base in Ohio, was located near a river, a major waterway, which could be used to speed up their annual travels. Similar to the Coopers in Marshall, the Harrisons returned their family members to Evansville for burial for decades. Harrison family members laid to rest at Evanville, Evansville's Oak Hill Cemetery include Isaac and his wife Elizabeth Stanley, their children Richard, Maria, and Valley, and Valley's family, including his two wives and four of his children. Isaac's death is quite tragic, and newspaper accounts vary, but the best that I can piece together, in the spring of 1901, he tried to intervene in a fight between his sons, Richard and Harry, while the family was making their way through Alabama. It was often reported that the fight broke out over a horse or because Isaac favored Richard. Isaac stepped in between the brothers, and Harry shot him. Harry fled and was thought to have gone to South America. In reality, he never left the U.S. He was injured in a railroad accident the year after shooting his father and on his deathbed confessed who he was and what he had done. Isaac's estate had been settled in Evansville's courts with inheritance for each of his children, including Harry. The court tried to disperse Harry's funds amongst his siblings, but none of them would take it, claiming it was blood money and that no good would come of it. Even their children would never claim it, they said. Newspapers reported that the court clerk was quite perplexed and didn't know what to do with the funds. A few months later, after reading reports of the events in her local paper, one young woman from New Jersey, no relation to the Harrisons, wrote to the court claiming she would gladly accept the money, even if no one else would. She wasn't bothered by superstitions. This is a good time to mention Gypsy royalty. In funeral notices, Isaac Harrison is often referred to as Gypsy Queen's consort or Queen's husband. Elizabeth Stanley Harrison was queen of her tribe, but Isaac was not the king. Gypsy royalty is not inherited in the same way traditional European monarchies are. In the Romani culture, old age is revered. There are four stages of life, infancy, childhood, adulthood, and old age. The king or queen is typically the oldest member of a family as they are considered the wisest. They had authority only over their own extended family, not the gypsy group as a whole. Within the American gypsy families, there would be multiple kings and queens at any given time. Newspapers of the time liked to proclaim king of all gypsies or all of North America, but this simply wasn't true. While titles were often passed through families from generation to generation, this was more based on age and wisdom, not simply because they were an heir to the title. Elections were sometimes held to establish the new king and queen. King and queen are actually terms that were picked up by the Romani language once they reached Europe and may have actually first been used to confuse and distract law enforcement, claiming someone else to be king so that the true leader of a clan could avoid detainment. And that brings us to the Coopers. You may recognize this large stone in Marshall Cemetery for Matt and Miranda Cooper. Matt and Miranda were both born in England in the late 1840s. We're unsure when they immigrated to the United States, but would guess the late 1850s or 1860s when many others were migrating. Matt's immigration year is listed on later census records as 1859 and 1868. The first record I've located for Matt and Miranda is their marriage in Evansville, Indiana in June of 1875. The 1900 census shows Matt and Miranda with their children, Oliver, William, Sylvia, Stanley, and Bessie in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Matt is listed as a horse dealer. The family traveled by wagon throughout the Midwest and South throughout the year trading horses and telling fortunes. 
The 1910 census finds the family right here in Illinois in Jasper County. The family is much larger now, includes in-laws and grandchildren. All men are listed as traders with no occupations listed for the women. Under ownership of home, they're all listed as transient. Hattie Reynolds Harrison, wife of Valley and daughter-in-law of the murdered Isaac, was a sister to our Queen Marilla Cooper Jones buried here in Marshall Cemetery. Their mother, Miranda Locke Cooper, who shares that big rose-colored stone with her husband Matt, was first married to a Shanty Reynolds. We know very little about Shanty, except that he was the father of Miranda's oldest daughter, Hattie. Miranda then married Matt, or Matthias Cooper, and had several more children. Here's one little corner of the family tree just to illustrate how complicated their relationships can be. Miranda Locke Cooper's daughter married Valley Harrison. Valley had been married before to Macy Stanley. Valley and Macy had two children, Lulu and Belle Mary. You'll see them on the right hand side of the screen. Then Hattie and Valley had four children, two girls and two boys. Valley's daughter Lulu married another man named Valley Harrison. When Lulu passed away, the younger Valley then married Emma Harrison, Lulu's half-sister, daughter of the older Valley and Hattie Reynolds. Now, I'm not saying there was anything inappropriate, illegal, or immoral about these marriages, just complicated. There's a third Valley that researchers have been unable to place in the family. We don't know who his parents are or how he fits into everything, even though he was in similar times and places as other members of the family. Other allied families that often married into the Cooper family include the Jeffreys, Joels, and Jones. Of Miranda's children, five never married, two married Joels, one Jones, one Jeffrey, three Stanleys, and one Harrison. The pattern continued with Matt and Miranda's grandchildren, with many men marrying members of the Jones, Stanley, and Harrison families. Now this photo uh, Miranda is right in the middle in the polka dot dress, and so those are her children and grandchildren around her. This is another photo taken at the same time in 1934, shortly before Miranda's death. This is Miranda with her son, Arky. The first record I've been able to locate of gypsies visiting the area comes from this July 17, 1873, Marshall Weekly Messenger, which complimented the quality of the traveler's horses, reported the cost of a fortune telling as $1, and had only good things to say about the group. The 1882 Marshall Herald reported that a band of gypsies was encamped here Friday and Saturday last, telling fortunes and trading horses. Visits were also recorded in the Herald in March and June of 1892 near Cleon, north of Martinsville, and near state line, again trading horses and telling fortunes. While we don't know for certain this was the Cooper family, it's certainly in line with what we know about them. Matt and later his sons were often listed as horse traders or livestock men, while the women were known to tell fortunes. The families have been very difficult to trace, and I've only located them in those 1900 and 1910 censuses. Here are a few more mentions in local newspapers about the gypsies' visits, including my favorite from the Clark County Herald in 1901. Since the gypsy fortune teller visited us, some of our young blood strut around like a bantam in his first crowing suit, in glorious anticipation of the bright future in store for them. Best stick to the old trade, boys. Old Mr. Toil is a hard old chap, but one that you can ever rely on. When visiting the Cooper family plot in Marshall Cemetery, we're always drawn first to Matt and Miranda's large rose-colored stone. Just in front of them is the one that started it all, little Louise Cooper. Louise passed away in the summer of 1894. I haven't been able to confirm exactly where Louise passed away, if it was here in Marshall or somewhere nearby, but reports have stated that the family chose to bury her here as local townspeople had always treated them kindly and with respect. This burial began a family tradition that would last for more than 70 years. And here's a list of those burials. Uh, first was Louise in 1894. Um, in 1901, 
Honor, a daughter-in-law of Matt and Miranda, the wife of their son, Jack. 1913, Marilla Jones, Matt and Miranda's daughter, and our Gypsy Queen. In 1920, Matt himself passed away. 1927, Marcella Jones, Queen Marilla's daughter-in-law. In 1930, Thomas, a grandson of Matt and Miranda. 1931, their son, Jack. 1931, Captola Jones, another daughter-in-law of Queen Marilla. 1934, Miranda herself was buried here. 1940, Douglas Fairbanks Jeffrey, a great-grandson. 1943, Stanley, Matt and Miranda's son. 1954, their son, Archie. Their daughter, Mary, in 1960. And the final burial, their daughter, Bessie, in 1968. This photograph was shared with us by Queen Marilla's grandson and shows Cooper family descendants visiting Matt and Miranda's grave in 1936. There's not one family plot for the Cooper family in Marshall Cemetery, but three. When coming up to the cemetery from Marshall and Clarksville Road, I always start at the gate farthest north, the nice large wrought iron one. Drive back to the second street and look to the left. You can't miss that large rose-colored stone for Matt and Miranda. Also in that same lot are the couple's children, Louise, Jack, Stanley, and Bessie. This plot is registered in Matt's name. Just up from them, at the blue star on the map, are Archie and Mary, two more of Matt and Miranda's children. A little further away, at the purple star, are Thomas, their grandson, Captola Jones, Queen Marilla's daughter-in-law, wife of her son, Sam, and Douglas Jeffrey, a great grandson of Matt and Miranda. This plot of graves is registered in Ollie's name. There are other burials reported in Marshall Cemetery by funeral records and obituaries, but the exact location is unknown. These include Honor Cooper, Marcella Jones, and even Queen Marilla herself. Marilla's unmarked grave strikes me as very odd since she passed away while Matt and Miranda were still both living and all of their other children buried here have grave markers. The reason's been reported as fear is grave robbing, but this has not been confirmed. Here are photos of the stones of Cooper family members, Matt and Miranda, and several of their children buried at that well-known spot in Marshall Cemetery. There is one empty spot in this lot without a marker. Could it be Queen Marilla? In the second plot, where Archie and Mary are buried, there's a large stone that says Cooper. Archie's stone is off to one side with an empty spot where Mary is recorded to be buried on the other. And finally, here are photos of the markers in the third lot. There are many empty spaces in this lot, and my suspicions are that Marcella Jones, daughter-in-law of Queen Marilla, the second wife of Saki Jones, whom he married after Captola passed away, is buried here. Perhaps Queen Marilla is in this lot too? An interesting note on the burial of Captola Jones, second wife of Saki Jones. She died in Bell Plains, Iowa on May 22nd and was buried there on May 24th. However, her body was exhumed just a few weeks later and brought to Marshall for burial in Marshall Cemetery on June 21st. Captola's maiden name was Harrison. Her grandmother was a Stanley. She was also the niece of Saki's first wife, Marcella Harrison. Captola was the daughter of Marcella's brother, Matt. All right, so our famous gypsy queen, Queen Morella Cooper Jones. We actually know very little about the woman herself. She was born in Memphis, Tennessee, March 4th, 1878. We do not know the first name of her husband, only that he was a member of the Jones gypsy family and died when Morella was about 19 years old. They had one son, Saki, born in Georgia in 1895. In later years, Saki changed his name to Sam. Morella died in Rector, Arkansas in March 1913 of dropsy or swelling of the heart. She was only 34 years old. Morella was born in 1878 near Memphis and married into another well-known gypsy family, the Jones. Her husband died very young, leaving Marilla with her son, Sam Saki Jones. Marilla's final journey to Marshall to be laid to rest in the spring of 1913 is quite a story. 
Her body was brought to Clark County by her father, Matt. It would take some time for family to arrive, traveling from all across the United States, so she was taken up to Paris to be held in a refrigerated vault until later that summer. Her funeral was held at the Congregational Church in Marshall in early June, the funeral sermon delivered by Reverend W.J. Drew. The Marshall Herald reported that hundreds of people from neighboring towns and counties came to Marshall expecting to see something spectacular. However, they were disappointed as the event was attended only by Marilla's close family members, which was reported as a small crowd of 35, including her parents, her son, four brothers, five sisters, and their families, and was not different from any other funeral at the time. The family, Miranda in particular, continued to return to the area to tend the graves as reported in local newspapers over the next several years, often spending a week or two in the area, accompanied by one of her daughters, usually Bessie or Mary. Local legend tells that one of the queens of the Cooper family placed a blessing on Marshall that prevents the city from being affected by a tornado. There are a few versions of the tale, but one often recorded refers to a large arrow-shaped stone placed somewhere outside of town that splits any tornado headed towards Marshall in half, causing it to go around city limits. Other versions tell that the blessing occurs simply because the Gypsy Queen is buried here. The origins of a legend like this can be difficult to determine, but research at Marshall Public Library has uncovered a very likely beginning to this particular tale. The Marshall Herald of May 30, 1917, reported the devastation from a multi-state weather event that affected communities across the Midwest and southeastern United States. The town of Livingston was completely destroyed. Other damage as reported by the Herald included, Marshall escaped very fortunately, being only in the edge of the storm. The Vandalia Telegraph Tower was blown down, and Dean Davidson, the operator on duty, was severely but not seriously cut and bruised. The milk condensery was partially unroofed. At the gypsy camp near the station, a large oak tree fell directly across a tent in which were a man and two women, none of whom were injured. The camp would have been located in the field near Vandalia Railroad Station, just off of Clarksville Road, south of Martinsville Cemetery. It seems very likely that this event was the beginning of the tales of the Gypsy Queen's blessing on the town and occurred just a few years after Queen Marilla's burial. Who first told the tale? We may never know. Was it a relative of Marilla, a survivor of the near tragedy, who first believed that it must be a blessing from the Queen? Or was it a local person observing the destruction all around while Marshall seemed purposefully spared? To illustrate the location of the gypsy camp, here's a photo of the Civilian Conservation Corps camp from the 1930s, which was built on Clarksville Road between the cemetery and the Vandalia train station. You can just see the train station in the upper right corner of the photo, and Clarksville Road would have been on the right hand side just outside of the photograph. And here's a close-up photo of the Vandalia Station. This map illustrates the path of the tornado outbreak that I believe prompted the Gypsy Tales. Overall, 383 people were killed over an eight-day period between May 25th and June 1st, 1917. At least 73 tornadoes occurred across the Midwest and Southeastern U.S. during this time, with 15 separate events that were classified as violent. F4 or F5 strength. The map from the Storm Prediction Center shows the tornadoes that occurred between May 25th and 27th. On May 26th, 108 people were killed across central Illinois, almost all in the Mattoon, Charleston area. Injuries totaled 638. And here's a little closer look at that map. Interesting how the storm stops at Marshall and jumps the state line. Now on April 5, 1947, Marshall High School was hit by a tornado that took off most of the roof of the building. The rest of the town was spared and the damage was done on a Saturday when no classes were in session and no one was injured. Coincidence or gypsy blessing? The towers and other ornamental structures were blown down with the heaviest damage occurring to the rear of the building. The roof was torn from the assembly and a portion of the gym. The entire third floor was a loss. Rain warped the floors and damaged desks. Classes were held for the rest of the year in the library and in storage rooms. 
The gym was used as a study hall with physical education classes moved outside. We're fortunate to have oral and written memories of several people who knew the Cooper family. One of the best sources is an interview with Morgan Newland conducted by Irma Davis in 2001. Morgan was born September 11, 1920 in Hudsonville, the son of Albert Newland and Mabel Raines Newland. He was raised in the West Union, Illinois area and lived in the family home on Route 1 from 1936 until his death in 2014. When Morgan was young, in the 1920s and early 1930s, the family lived on a farm just outside West Union. The Cooper family often visited in the spring, in April or May, Morgan recalled, and then again in the summer, in August. They would stay two or three weeks each visit. In the spring, they were heading north to make their rounds, trading horses and telling fortunes. In the fall, they were heading south again to winter quarters. Morgan had very fond memories of playing with the gypsy children. Morgan's mother was an amateur photographer, and Morgan mentioned several photographs in his interview, photos of the family and their wagon. I have been unable to locate these photographs. Morgan remembered their well-bred horses and large, colorful wagons. In the 1920s and 30s, when the Cooper family visited, Morgan's father owned a farm just south of West Union near Lower Union School. Morgan tells the gypsies always camped on his father's land. This 1918 plat map shows the location of the school. Morgan's father, Albert, attended the funeral of Queen Marilla in 1913, as reported in the Robinson Argus newspaper. Morgan recalled the gypsies had little formal education but were very smart, especially with money and trading. The children did not attend school, and young Morgan was always upset during the gypsies' visit in the fall when he had to walk through their camp, past the children playing, to get to his classes at Lower Union School. The children would often try to model their parents and make trades. Pocket knives, in particular, were a favorite item amongst the boys. Each boy would have a knife, and after a few days of playing together with local children, whittling on sticks, the gypsy children knew what kind of knives the locals had, and the locals thought they knew the gypsy knives. One of the visitors would suggest, would suggest a trade, and a local would agree to it. Then would receive a different knife from the gypsy youngin, perhaps one with a broken handle or missing two thirds of its blade. Morgan's sister got her revenge once though. One of the gypsy children wanted to trade chickens. The gypsy wagons had crates of chickens underneath, including little banties, and the banties belonged to the children. This boy, called Punk, was 13 or 14 years old. Morgan recalled his sister being just four or five years old. The young man suggested many trades, a rooster for a hen, which she said wasn't a good deal. He tried many combinations before finally agreeing to trade one of his hens for her rooster, which was not a good trade for him, but at least he was trading something. Morgan's sister said okay and pointed to a rooster that she'd trade, knowing that it had a bad eye. The elders gave Punk a hard time that this little girl had pulled one over on him. Morgan recalls local farmers looking forward to the visits each year, trading with the Coopers horse for horse. Although the travelers always did well and seemed to come out ahead, locals did not feel cheated and enjoyed trading with the gypsy men. Morgan remained particularly close with one of Matt and Miranda Cooper's grandsons, Ollie. Ollie was the son of Matt and Miranda's son, Oliver. Morgan recalled one incident with a young newlywed couple who were having quite a quarrel. They didn't have much, but did have a nice little stove and a brand new set of pots and pans of their own. The young woman was running around, yelling at the man, throwing pans at him while he chased her. Morgan Hatt and his father were cultivating corn in a field right next to the camp, and when they heard this commotion, his dad had him stop working. Morgan said the little stove was just puffing out smoke the whole time, and they thought it was going to survive the quarrel, but then the man hit it with an axe and just demolished that little stove. He never hit the young woman, though. Morgan and his father, while visiting the camp later that evening, asked about what happened, but didn't receive any info. The gypsies were very private, and if they didn't want to talk about something, they just didn't. Years later, Morgan asked Ollie about that fight. Well, Ollie said, that young man had gone out with a couple of older fellows horse trading, and when they came back in, he had lipstick on his collar. Well, that's all he had to say, because gypsy ladies didn't wear lipstick. The travelers never carried guns that Morgan was aware of. They were just nice people, peaceful people, he recalled. Ollie continued to visit Morgan twice a year up until sometime in the 1980s. Ollie would be traveling to Florida. 
Morgan wasn't sure why Ollie stopped visiting, but my research shows that Ollie Cooper Jr. passed away in August of 1981. And here are a few more Cooper family photographs, courtesy of a relative on Ancestry.com. Dinah Cooper Jeffrey is not buried here in Marshall, but her grandson Douglas is, and she's a daughter of Matt and Miranda. And then Stanley Cooper, Matt and Miranda's son, who is buried here at Marshall Cemetery. And here's an interesting local record. This is Stanley's World War I draft registration card from June of 1917. The family was visiting Robinson at the time, so Stanley registered at the Crawford County office. Stanley, age 27, was still single, but listed his parents as dependents. At the time, Matt's health had started to fail, as was reported in local Marshall papers. The registrar noted, parents are supposed to be well-to-do, are traveling gypsies. Another local who remembered the Cooper family was Basil Moore. Basil handled the arrangements for some of the later Cooper family funerals and got to know the family very well. He often shared stories and memories of them and once even visited elementary students at North School with a group of members of the Cooper family. He later reported he wasn't sure who enjoyed the visit more, the Coopers or the school children. Basil recalled the family fondly as respectful and well-mannered. He had heard stories of the gypsies as a child and first met them in 1954 at the funeral of King Archie Cooper. Archie's sister Bessie, later the last of the family to be buried here, was the first Cooper that Basil met. Basil acted as spokesman for the election of a new king and queen in 1968 after Bessie's funeral. Andy Young was elected king and Marjorie Lovell queen. He recalled Saki Jones, son of Queen Marilla, bellowing, head him up and move him out as he parked cars at the funeral. You never heard such a big voice and such a little fellow. When he spoke, they paid attention. Earlier burials for Jack, Miranda, and Stanley Cooper, as well as Captola Jones, were recorded in Bubeck and Gallagher funeral home records. Bubeck family lore, as reported by Bev on the library's Facebook page, says that Miranda's funeral expenses were paid with a bag of gold. In his book, Growing Up on Big Creek, Dan Reedy recalls many local residents, events, and memories of growing up in Livingston. Each chapter focuses on a different memory. In I'll Sell You to the Gypsies, he recalls how his mother used to threaten Dan and his brother when they misbehaved. His research came from many of the same articles I've already shared, early visits to the area and family history. One of his personal memories of the family was a visit from the 1950s when the family camped next to Georgia Reese's East Marshall Motel. By this time, Dan recalls, Buicks, Lincolns, and Cadillacs provided the horsepower and large house trailers had replaced bow top wagons. An interesting note on the gypsy camps, the elder, more respected, and probably king and queen of the group, always chose their camp location first, usually in the prime spot nearest the roadway, so they could be the first to receive visitors to the camp, looking to trade or have their fortunes told. So where are the Coopers today? Of course, modernization in World War II in particular changed the lifestyle of these traveling families. The grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the families have settled down. Many previously traveling families now run concrete businesses, sewer and septic maintenance, driveway paving, etc. For the Cooper family, many descendants are still heavily involved in the horse business, raising and training thoroughbreds throughout Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas. The information that I've shared might be a little different from what we've been taught in the past, which has been passed down from our local lore, but I've done my best to present it accurately and based on factual research. This research was very different than a traditional genealogy project. Because of the way the families traveled so much, records like census, birth, and deaths could be difficult to track. The best sources were the newspapers. Both Marshall Public Library's Digital Archive and Newspapers.com. The local papers helped paint the picture of the family's visits to Marshall, while Newspapers.com's national coverage, especially obituaries, gave a lot of clues where to look for records, death records in particular. I've also been in contact with Norman Burton, a Cooper family relative in the UK, Willard Library in Evansville for funeral home records, and Tennessee, Arkansas, and Louisiana 
county clerks for death records. We do have a collection of resources, both printed, published books, and a binder containing much of our local research for anyone that's interested in taking a look and digging a little deeper into the family. This program was researched and presented by Marshall Public Library's head librarian, Jamie Porman. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Email jporman at marshallplib.com.